guys, it's Matt with Olympus Reptiles, and today you're going to see me play with my stick. <laughs> we have, Colin does it well. I got my buddy Colin here, and as you guys have seen, Colin does a lot of our big lizard stuff. One thing Colin doesn't do too much of, but has expressed some interest in, is some of our venomous things, especially our rattlesnakes or crotalus stuff. So, Colin said, hey, let's do a video and let's look at some of these rattlesnakes. And you guys know me, if I can play with rattlesnakes, I'm probably going to do it. So what do you want to see today? Do you know? Yeah, well, I was hoping I could learn something about your western diamondbacks over here. So I see a couple on the floor here. I was hoping we could get out and look at them. I do. We were got, uh, I, I picked three specific western diamondbacks to show Colin here to show you guys while we're at it. Uh, I often say that western diamondbacks are the ball python of the venomous world. Now, when I'm saying that, I don't want you to mistake it for me saying they have a ball python attitude because that couldn't be further from the truth. If you give one of these a chance, they're going to hold their ground. If you encroach on their ground, they will light you up. To the point that I even had one today that I was going to show in this video, I decided not to show because I was having such a bad mood day. I didn't want to continue to work with it and stress it out. It was just a little too risky to put that snake on video and have my attention divided at all with it. Uh, so they're not like that, but... Genetically, they're like ball pythons. So what I mean is there's so many morphs out there. So this is one that is an albino. It's got something else going on there. And you'll see what I'm talking about when we open this tub. We'll see if it stays put. It's going to run out of me. There she is. This, look at all the lavender in that, Colin. Do you see that? She is a beautiful animal. It's a lot different than a normal albino. And that's one thing I love about these guys is all the lavender you can get. I have other albinos that are a lot more traditional white, but this has got something else going on in it. It's very alert. Right they now. are. They know what's going on. You can see it's heat pit, so if this doesn't move and gets close, she wouldn't care. She'll see that movement, but see, she's not striking at it. Yeah. Now, if that was warm and it was this close, it's going to hit it. Mm -hmm. It's definitely going to hit it. So their heat pits work really well. Their strike is one of the fastest in the animal kingdom. Not the fastest, but it's up there. Their venom toxicity on a Western Diamondback is very, very high. It's not going to be in the top ten like when you start playing with your Aussies. All you Australians that watch us, you guys have like the craziest crap in your backyard. I'm kind of jealous. But they have loads and loads of venom. So where they lack some of that high-end toxicity, they make up for in venom load. Let's see if this will cooperate for us at all. So you had briefly mentioned about the genetics here. So mm -hmm. for people on my channel who don't know a whole lot about um, this kind of stuff, you're like maybe more relatable to ball pythons. Um, <laughs> being albino, uh, that it is a recessive, and so uh, it, it does have to have uh, two genes to actually look albino. It does. Um, and this is where you get rattlesnakes on the floor, Colin. Yeah, this is going very well. It, this is normal when you work with these guys. <laughs> what we'll do is we'll just kind of not let him run until I get a chance. There we go. Now, we also have tongs if we need it. There we go. That's where I want you. We can get that thing by the tail. Try to throw it to my buddies. Come on, little buddy, calm down. And there we are. Now, it looks a lot more dramatic than it is. And when you got one on the floor like that, the big thing is minding where your distance is and keeping yourself away from the bite end. Now, I've got it by the tail, and i got my hook up here in the mid-body, so it can't strike back. I've got that part controlled, and you can see we're pretty calm. I'm not rattling. It was never rattled on the floor. It was never agitated. This gives you a good chance to see that color. And for you guys in the camera, it probably looks like we're closer to it than we are, but uh, really not that bad. So what do you think of these as far as just pretty when you compare them to? It is just uh, unbelievable. Its scales are so much like more, um, they stick out, and it, it has such a, like a texture to it. They it's are a keel easy. scale. Yeah. Come on, yeah. bounce off the ground here a little bit. There we go. There we go. Don't you think you're moving? They are a keel scale. You can see this thing's very fat and healthy. Mm -hmm. One weird thing about rattlesnakes is for most species, maybe all, I don't quote me on all, but certainly for most, males are bigger than females. Okay. Completely opposite from the ball python world. Where you have the big girl, the little bitty dude, these are kind of the opposite. Do you have any also, theories on why that is? I don't actually know why they developed that way. We're going to put this one back in the box. This one's always my runner. It doesn't like to go where it's supposed to. <laughs> Don't throw it, Jeff. We'll just pick her up with a tongue if we have to. Like I say, when you got one not cooperating, you got to use all of your tools. And there's a trick on these buckets. You don't want your finger over the lid. <laughs> For that purpose. Yep. That's quite a jump. Yeah, they are 
very, very fast in the septum itself. Once we got that, we lose the light. We flip those, put that one to the side. Oh, that's what it was. Okay, we lost a little bit of lizard light. Now the next one I show you should be a little easier to handle because it's smaller. This is starting to get into what you can do with some combinations on these guys. And this we open it, we'll keep that as a shield. And this is a combination. Oh, we lost a little piece of rattle in there. It's not in travel. Shed. Well, they don't shed the rattle. Oh, yeah. yeah. The rattle actually gets longer with each and every shed. So, when they break it, they have to regrow it. Yeah, so to address that kind of the myth of uh, do rattlesnakes have as many rattles as they are as many years old? Um, it's, yeah. No. No, no. <laughs> it's not years old, it's shit. False, there yeah. you can see that rattle, and you see how that rattle comes to a point. I don't know how far you can zoom, Kurt, and get to that. But you can see how it comes to a point there. That tells you that rattle's never been broken. That mm -hmm. very, very nice point. This is what they call a purple haze. We got this snake when it was pretty much a, a baby. I always say hatchling, but that's not true because they're also a live birth. Its colors are really coming in. It gave me a little bit of a fit. I've had to keep it weird. I've had to keep it more moist than I normally do for rattlesnake to help with shedding. It did have a few rough sheds. And when you have to assist a rattlesnake with shedding, that's not as much fun. <laughs> I can't imagine. But we've got that going. It eats like a boss. And you can see that orange coming through there, almost that cream. How just beautiful this snake is. This is probably the smallest rattlesnake I would tail. What I mean by tailing, is like you saw with the other one, I had it by the tail. I wouldn't do it with anything smaller than this. The fear being that when your hand's close to a small snake, it can turn around and get you. This is about the shortest snake I would do that with. And a lot of times, see if this will cooperate, if they're calm, and you get them up, they'll stay on the hook. That one's not going to do it. So, yeah, I don't like those go up too far. I don't want to take a fall, too long of a fall. But a lot of times, they'll actually stay on the hook for you when they're in a mood. I don't know what the weather is today, but everybody's angry. They will draw back on the nose. But anyway, that's our purple haze. Any questions about this combination? Um, what are the genetics that go into that? That's a good question. <laughs> this is a caramel albino, so it's a ty tyrosine positive albino, T positive. It also has a hypermelanistic gene they call black in it. Okay. So what you've got is hypermelanistic caramel albino. So you're adding more melanin in there and then using the caramel albino to strip it out, except the tyrosine, and what you get is this kind of lavenderish, purplish snake down on the spots that when they change the tail anyway normally, you get that orange. Very, very, very cool animal. If you look, the eyes are red because of that albino in there. Just, I think these are gorgeous. I want to take it a step farther and put true albino in there and make it even more loud. It almost come out with banana ball python colors. It is wild. Yeah, that's exactly what I was about to ask you. Like, what are your plans on this breeding wise? That's my plans there. I want to bring more albino, like an actual albino into it with that black. Yeah. I think they're really pretty. So anyway, any other questions about that one? Very cool little animal there. It is. We won't throw that one on the floor. But I've got one more animal to show you. Now, this is my favorite one out of these three. It's hot in here is what I'm sweating. And what this is, this is, uh, for those of you that watch both mine and Colin's channel, I know we're trying to get some of that crossed together. You've heard me talk about the Blood Diamond Project. And Colin, you've heard me talk yeah, about the Blood yeah. Diamond Project. This is one that's pretty special to Matt. I know. I've heard <laughs> this, talk a lot. <laughs> this is one of the Blood Diamonds. We have three of these that came out of uh, Oklahoma off of some private land. You have to have special permission to be on the hunt, which we had. Two of them were caught by buddies of mine, and they gave them to me, and they heard I wanted to do this one. Well, it's not as red as a female I've shown. This is one that I caught. So me and my team out hunting with one of my buddies caught this snake and were blown away by it. And that's when they said, well, if you want to take that home for breeding, when we get all the USDA stuff done, so we're not breeding them yet, but we plan on it. And then uh, I'll give you this one. Another guy said, I'll give you this one. It's how we have the three. So this is kind of the guy that started it all. And uh, he, his color, isn't as like, say, this red as a female, so it's very, very red. And I can always tell him from the other ones because he has a scar on his face. There was a wildfire that had gone through there. And he actually been burnt on the head. And you can still see that black right there. You can still see that scar. It does. Sounds different. It does. His rattle's not nearly as nice as the other one. The pitch is different. It is. It's a lot lower. That's because all of his pieces are a lot more blunt. His rattle has been broken. 
which is really common for a wild snake. There, you can see it. Huh. So see how it's not as long? Yeah, it's very short. That's another reason why you can't tell age. Like yeah. Stop right a little bit so you can really see it. Do you want to feel something cool? I wish you guys take your hook and just touch that tail and feel the vibration that slides up through your hook. Wow. <laughs> That's powerful. That is the fastest muscle in the animal kingdom. Faster than hummingbird wings. Nothing is quicker than the muscles and the tail of a rattlesnake. To me, that's really cool. I love these guys, man. I, I just do. And I wish I had a normal to stick by it so you could really see the difference in the camera. See what happens? Hi, buddy. But again, we're distance enough away that when they strike, well, it's going to shock you a little bit. He doesn't get anywhere near me. He got to maybe here. My knee's another two feet. So it's all about distance and how far away you are. That's how you work these safely. If you look, you can see the color in there, some of the red that comes out. You sit yeah. here. The, the force on that is amazing. See that wet? Where you bit that? He did leave a little bit of a venom on it, no big deal. But the, yeah, they're very, very strong. But you can really see just the color that comes in. And part of my hand has been on it, so it is warm, so you does see a heat signature. And if you look at the eye stripes, where it's usually really white, his are kind of a cream. Mm -hmm. So very, very interesting animal. So do you, do you have any ideas like what might be going on here? It's just a, a gene that is making it express more of the red pigmentation? I don't rightly know. I'm hoping it's a gene. Yeah. And my theory is it is a gene. My theory is it is going to prove genetic. Yep. I've heard some theories. A lot of people say, oh, it's been crossed with Ruber. Or they tell me it is the Ruber. Uh -huh. This came from Oklahoma. People, it can't be Ruber. Not in Oklahoma. You are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of miles away from their nearest territory. Yeah. It is not Ruber, I promise. Yeah. Uh, so that theory is kind of out the window. The next theory I heard was, well, you got all that red clay there. The animal stained red from the red clay. Yeah. And that makes some sense. It washes and rains out and they are in the right spot. But it's been in captivity for so long now and it's still red. Right. He's been in captivity for about 18, 19 months. He shed multiple times and we've maintained that color. So it's definitely not a stain. No. So that leaves me with just, it's a weird occurrence. The other thing you'll hear is, the rattlesnakes are really cool, because you can go here and catch them on, then you can go 30 miles over here and catch them look vastly different, because they'll line breed those traits to their small population. So you have this locale difference. It's really not genetic, it's just a locale difference. Yeah. And I think that's wild. Like, you can look and, like, that's an Oklahoma snake and that's a Texas snake. Yeah. And you can see the difference. Yeah. That's really neat. But I don't think this is locality, because when I found him, out of the same hole, we found four normals. Yeah. Out of the same hole. The other two guys that caught him were finding 30 normals to one of these. Yeah. So I don't think it's a location thing, because typically if it's a locale thing, they'll all kind of be that way in that locale. Yeah. Uh, so that's been bred, and those genetics that are best at locale have been passed on. Yeah. A good example would be, you know, if you've got one that's in more of a rocky area, a lot of times you'll find them a lot more speckled, because they pass that on better, those babies survive better. Yeah. And pretty soon it's so it would make sense that the red would do well in a red soil area. It would. You know, that, so that would. It, it, I think as we were talking like a while back about how it could be a recessive gene mm -hmm. that's just hiding in the population, and it's starting to become more of an occurrence. It's like pressure in them becomes higher in the wild. Um, right. And so we'll find out pretty quickly if you bred your red male to the albino female. That's our plan. Once yeah. we get that rolling, we want to breed yeah. that first. I expect all normal. Yeah. The other thing this could be, and I'm not sure, and you've seen her female. The camera guy, Kurt, feel free to chime in. You've seen the female a lot. She looks a lot different than this. Mm -hmm. She does, yeah. A lot different. Yeah. Her red is out of this world compared to this one. This one's out of this world compared to a normal. Perhaps she's a homozygous version of whatever that is. Right. Yeah. This could be an incomplete dominant gene in that respect. Now, yeah. I'm not saying it is, so don't go quote me on that. I'm just saying we don't know, and that possibility is certainly there. Or it could just be an expression difference, too, in, in both homozygous animals. But if this was a locale, I think it'd all be that way. And the fact that you're finding one occasionally tells me there's a good chance of recessive trait being passed on. So that's kind of where I'm coming from on that. And you can see he's really fat, really thick, really happy. And look now, on the cool end, I can touch him, and we're not trying to bite that. There's those heat pits for him. Look at that. Pretty cool. Any questions about this snake? Have, have you had much of a like a difference in keeping the ones that have been long term wild versus ones that you've gotten as early on captives? Like, yes. Do you notice a big difference? I do. I'll tell you, these guys are smart. You know, we always talk about snakes not being very intelligent, but they're, they're really actually focused intelligence. Yeah. You yeah. and I've had that yeah. conversation yeah. many times. 
they do recognize people. I, I do believe that. And that doesn't mean I think the throttle sync knows me and I think we're buddies. Yeah. But if you put one on display every day and see the same people every day, like those in there, yeah. they don't rattle anymore, hardly yeah. at all. That's because they see us every day and they don't see us as that threat. They've learned to be, okay, this isn't a threat. Uh, mine at home hardly rattle anymore. I've taken to eat in front of me when they wouldn't used to do that. So it does take some time they do adjust the captivity, but at first, a wild one can be a lot harder to get to, to go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Most of them feed very, very well for me, but they won't feed in front of me. They'll, they'll be so worried about eating that prey item with me around, that they'll just set and focus yeah. on me. And I have to leave. I even set cameras to watch to make sure they're feeding and move on my day. So there is certainly a difference in that. I see again with this being warm. Now if I touch them with this, it's probably a lash out of it. No, we're going to be tracing it. Yeah, see, there he goes. So you add a little heat, you get that lash out, and you get that. Which is a little bit of a spot of venom. Not a huge amount, but it would be enough for my day. You want to drink that? Yeah, I'm good. No, it won't hurt you. Yeah. That's the little thing about venom that a lot of you don't know. I, you can't actually drink that stuff. I wouldn't recommend it. I'm not going to take a bit of dentist today, but it, it will break down in your stomach acid. It's a protein chain. So once it gets introduced into your tissue to be absorbed, it's not going to do anything. People are like, oh, you don't know about that. Yeah, I do. These guys will load a rat full of venom kill it, and then they go eat it Well, it's full of venom, and they're not immune to their own toxins. Yeah. Doesn't hurt them a bit. So you can't actually drink it. I've actually done it, just to prove a point. But uh, you don't want to do it. You have any open wounds, any chance of the wounds in the mouth. How did that taste? Bitter. <laughs> Bitter and it's sticky. <laughs> you don't want to drink something afterwards, kind of, well, it's kind of gross. But, uh, all right, any other questions about what, this guy? What type of venom do they have? Their venom is hemotoxic. Rattlesnake venom is pretty much 100% hemotoxic. So they're going to attack the blood system, the tissue system. They're going to cause swelling. They're going to cause pain. They're going to cause necrosis of the flesh. Your flesh will literally die while it's still on your body. And as it continues to work and attack that blood system, it can start to mess up your heart rhythm, your heart rate, all kinds of bad things. That's how it works to kill you. As opposed to, say, like a Mojave Green, which is this really nasty, nasty cocktail that has a lot of uh, neurotoxin in it. And the neurotoxin a lot of them will shut down your diaphragm, stopping you from breathing. Now, a straight up neurotoxin, we're getting kind of off topic, is that all right? Yeah. A straight up neurotoxin, some of those bites aren't nearly as painful as, say, a hemotoxin bite. Some of them are even no pain. There's stories people have been bit and thought, oh, it's a dry bite, I'm cool, I'm fine, it's not hurting. Then they realize parts of their body are shutting down because that neurotoxin is interrupting them with the communication in the nerves. Where these guys, you get bit, within about 30 seconds, you know if it's dry or not, because you're going to hurt. I've watched people get bit. It isn't a joke. I don't ever want to be bit. I don't ever put myself in a chance to get bit. That's why I keep that distance. Uh, most people say it's like some of your blood is going to be placed with battery acid. I've had women who have had children with no epidural tell me they'd rather have twins than get bit by one of those again. So any ladies that watch us that have kids, this is worse than childbirth, according to women, not me, not me. Women have told me that, that have been bit. So that's kind of what that venom can do. Any other questions? Uh, how big do they get? Westerns actually, I believe, hold the record for the longest rattlesnake still, slightly above Easterns. Now, individuals, I would imagine the Eastern can actually get longer. Easterns hold the record for the largest heaviest body. Think of like a reticulated pythons and anacondas. One's actually a little bit longer, but the biggest snake is actually the uh, anaconda. Right. So, but it's within a couple inches. They've been over 80 inches. I think they've even approached 90 a few times, but I don't have the exact record in mind, but I know 84 at least has been done. All those pictures you guys see online of, I caught this monster 120 inch western diamondback. If you look up photo tricks, they're all photo tricks and every one of those guys are full of shit. I will say it right here. If you have that picture and you've got your beer can and your board, you're holding out and saying you've got an eight foot western diamond back, you're a lying piece of crap. You don't have it, okay? Quit posting that shit. Because then I get phone calls about, did you see this? Yes, it's fake. So the common size for these guys is about three feet to about five feet. They can get longer than that. I've seen snakes longer than that. I think my personal. The largest I've seen was about 76 inches. Wow. And that snake was as big around as a beer can, and it was strong. And it had a hand that was the size of, you know, a, a preteen's fist or a small woman's fist. Not my fist. This is about the biggest Eastern Diamondback head you'll see. But just a lot of power and a lot of strength in those animals. So, any other questions? 
All right, guys. Cole, what do you think? Yeah, that's a great time. I've learned a lot today. You ready to play with one? Yeah, I don't know about that. <laughs> I don't know about that. I think we'll save that for another day. But uh, <laughs> thanks for teaching me everything. No today. problem. I enjoyed a lot. One last thing for you go about why I love these animals, rattlesnakes in particular, especially westerns. Westerns one of my favorite rattlesnakes. Is you go watch an old western movie and you hear that rattling sound and you see John Wayne looking at something and hip shooting and all this. These guys are in there. This is a piece of American war and a piece of American history. No other reptile in our nation holds as much history as western diamondbacks and timber rattlesnakes. They just don't. Timber's being featured on the Gadsden flag and written about by Benjamin Franklin way back when our country first started. And these guys being that piece of the Wild West lore, everybody heard about the great western diamondback. So I, I love these guys because to me they represent the most bad American reptile there is. Yeah. These guys are probably American alligators are the reptile that I think yeah. is our quintessential, you know, top of the food chain, badass reptile. So, yeah. absolutely. All right, guys, thanks for watching. And uh, next time I'll get back to playing with my balls instead of my sticks.